Hello everyone and welcome back to another Signals and Systems video. Today we're going to talk about the solution of differential equations using the Laplace transform. The specific equation we're going to solve today is this simple second order differential equation. Um, d squared y dt squared plus 3 dy dt plus 2y of t is equal to 10x of t. So if we're going to use the Laplace transform, what we do first is transform the differential equation. So we take the Laplace transform of each of these terms here. And so that's pretty straightforward to do if you understand the differentiation property. Um, and so the transform of the first term, d squared y dt squared, comes out to be s squared y of s minus s y of 0 minus minus y prime of 0 minus, that's the derivative of y at 0, um, plus then the next term will be 3 times the transform of dy dt, which is uh, s y of s minus y prime of 0 minus, and then we get plus 2y of s is equal to 10x of s. Okay, so we've transformed each of these terms individually. The first one results in these three terms here. The second transform results in these two terms. This results in a uh, single term, 2y of s, and this transform results in a single term, 10x of s. And so we can rearrange this equation just a little bit, make it look a little simpler. And we group, um, we group the terms that have y of s in them first. So we get s squared plus 3s plus 2 times y of s. And then is equal to 10x of s. And now I'm going to move um, all of the terms involving the initial conditions over to the right-hand side as well. Um, and so what I'm left with is plus s plus 3 times y of 0 minus. Oops. Plus y prime of 0 minus. So I've just reorganized this equation uh, to get it in this form. And then ultimately what I'm trying to solve for is y of t, so I need to get y of s by itself on the left hand side. So I just divide both sides of the equation by this, and then I'm left with y of s by itself. So if I do that, <coughs> excuse me, if I do that, I get y of s is equal to 10 over s squared plus 3s plus 2 x of s uh, plus um, s plus 3 times y of 0 minus plus y of y prime of 0 minus over s squared plus 3s plus 2. Okay, so now we have this uh, equation in a form where we could just take the inverse transform of these two terms individually and get y of t. But it's helpful to think a little bit about what these two terms mean. Notice that this first term here only depends on the input x of s, not on any of the initial conditions. The initial condition terms are over here. And so we can um, have names for each part of this uh, solution. Um, and so this part here we will call the zero state response. Usually abbreviated ZSR. And this term here we will call the zero input response. or ZIR. Okay, and 
we can see why these names are reflective of, of each part of the solution. So the zero input response, this piece, is all that you would get if x of s was zero. So if the input x of t is zero, the input is zero, then this term goes away and I'm just left with this term. So that's why we call it the zero input response. This term over here is the zero state response and we call it the zero state response because that's what we get when all of the initial conditions go away. All of the initial conditions go to zero, so the system is said to be in a zero state initially. So this is the zero state response. The zero state response contains the response due to the input alone, and the zero input response contains the response due to the initial conditions alone. Okay, so it's helpful to, to split that up uh, into two pieces sometimes, to think about them separately. So now let's see what the inverse transform the, the other thing we can do is we can now take the inverse transform of each of these two terms and uh, get the resulting y of t. In order to solve the differential equation, we have to know what the input is. So for this problem, we're going to assume that the input is the unit step, u of t, and we're going to assume that the initial conditions are that y at 0 minus, meaning just before the application of the input, is equal to 1, and the derivative of y at 0 minus is equal to 2. So we can now plug in for, um, we have to plug in for x of s, well the transform of x of t is u of t, transform of u of t is just 1 over s. So we can plug that in, and we get, we'll get 10 over, and I'm going to rewrite this, um, as s, well, let me factor this as I go along. So um, I can factor this denominator as s plus two, 1 times s plus 2. So I'll write it out that way. s plus 1 times s plus 2, and then times 1 over s, that's the transform of x of t. Then I'll just substitute in for the initial conditions, and I'll get s plus 3 times 1 uh, plus uh, 2 over s plus 1 times s plus 2 there. And all I've done there is just factored. Note that this is the same denominator on both pieces, so the factorization is the same. So now I can, if I'm going to try and take the inverse transform of this, I would have to do partial fractions first, which means I split it up into a bunch of component terms. And so I could split this up, and it would be a over s plus 1 plus b over s plus 2 plus c over s. And all of that is just the partial fraction expansion of the first term. And then the partial fraction expansion of the second term will consist of two pieces. It'll be d over s plus 1 plus e over s plus 2. Now, a, b, c, d, and e are just the partial fraction expansion coefficients, and we'll see how to get those on the next page. But let's first think about what the inverse transform of this system will look like. And so we just, all we have to do is inverse transform each term individually. So if we do that, we will get y of t is equal to a e to the minus t u of t. That's for this first term. And then we get b e to the minus 2t u of t plus c u of t. Um, and then plus d e to the minus t u of t plus e e to the minus 2t u of t. Okay, this is still split up into two pieces. This whole piece here would still be the ZSR. And this whole piece here would be the ZIR. 
Okay, so that this gives us the expression uh, for what y of t is equal to, um, and all we need to know now is what the constants are, the partial fraction expansion coefficients a through e. Um, so let's look at how to get those. So to save a little time, I've written these out ahead of time. Um, the, the expression that we get for y of s um, is this one here, um, and all I've done, it'll be, uh, it is I've um, combined terms on this side, and so simplified it a little bit, but it's the same expression that we had on the previous page. And then I've written out the partial fraction expansion in this line. Um, so these are, uh, the partial fraction expansion is for non-repeated roots, non-repeated poles, and so it's pretty straightforward to do using the heavy side approach, or sometimes called the cover-up method. So we can solve for A by, it will be this here if we cover up the s plus 1 pole, so we just get 10 over s plus 2 times s, and we evaluate that at the pole associated with the, the a term, which is at s equal minus 1. So we just plug in and we get 10 over minus 1 plus 2 times minus 1, and that gets us minus 10. And we can solve for b in a similar fashion, c, d, and e, and we get those coefficients. I encourage you to work through those on your own and hopefully verify that um, you get the same answers that I do. So now, once we have the coefficients, it's straightforward to go back and plug in and see what the final answer looks like. So if I go ahead and plug in the coefficients that I just derived, I get my final answer is y of t is minus 10 e to the minus 10, sorry, minus 10 e to the minus t plus 5 e to the minus 2t plus 5, and all of that is times u of t. That's the ZSR. And then the ZIR is 4 e to the minus t minus 3 e to the minus 2t, also times u of t. And remember, the ZSR is the response we get when the initial conditions are 0, and the ZIR is the response we get when the input is 0. Now the total response is equal to the ZSR plus the ZIR, and if we add these two together, we get minus 6e to the minus t plus 2e to the minus 2t plus 5, all of that times u of t. Now, if our final, if, if all we wanted was the total response, and we didn't care about um, the individual ZSR and ZIR, we could have just combined these expressions much earlier on. So for instance, I could have just combined these two things first and then done the partial fraction expansion, which would have only required solving for three coefficients, and then I could take the inverse transform of that. But it's sometimes nice to be able to split out the ZSR and the ZIR and to see explicitly where they come from. And so that's why I've solved the equation this, this way. Now one other note about the ZSR. The ZSR is what we get, so the transform of the ZSR is just simply equal to h of s, the system function, times x of s, the transform of the input. Or written another way, we could say that the ZSR piece of this is h of t, the impulse response of the system, convolved with the input. Okay, That's the ZSR, that's the response when the system starts off in a zero initial state, or in other words, all of the initial conditions are zero. Now we can also relate, uh, there are other ways to solve uh, differential equations, and we can relate our solution um, to those, and we'll see how we, we make that relationship in a moment. But first I want to talk about steady state and transient responses. So sometimes you hear people talk about the transient response and the steady state response of a particular system. The transient response is simply anything that goes, the part of the response that goes to zero as t goes to infinity. So that means as time gets very large, the transient dies out, and then all we're left with is the steady state component. The steady state component is defined as what doesn't die out. So for this particular solution, um, the, two, the first two terms, minus 6e to the minus t and 2e to the minus 2t, both are decaying real exponentials, and so they go to zero as t goes to infinity. And then we're just left with this term here, 5 u of t, and that would be the steady state response. So the steady state is, is what hangs around as t gets 
uh, very large. I would point out that the steady state response doesn't always have to be constant. If instead of having u of t as an input, we had a constant input here to this, for this problem, uh, and we got a constant steady state output. But if we'd had a cosine input, we would have been left with a cosine as a part of the output, and that would be the steady state response. So it's not a constant, but it is, the cosine is not dying off as t gets large, and so that's why it would be the steady state piece of the response. Okay, finally, let's try and relate um, this particular solution method using Laplace to how we would solve differential equations in the classical sense. So earlier in this semester, we talked about solving differential equations and writing the solution in terms of a homogeneous piece and a particular piece. Um, the homogeneous piece is, would be solutions to the differential equation where you set all of the input terms equal to zero. So you set the right-hand side equal to zero. And you solve this, and you get a particular form for the homogeneous, well, you solve for the characteristic, you solve the characteristic equation, get the form of this solution, um, and then um, you can later solve for the coefficients associated with that solution. Also, it's, so we have the homogeneous piece and then we have the particular piece. In this case, for this particular problem, we would have assumed that the particular solution is constant um, since the input is constant. So we would have assumed that yp was constant and solved for that constant. And the final result will be equal to exactly what we got. Okay, so we could have run through these steps and solved the differential equation using this approach, and we would have gotten the exact same total um, response solution. So we would get the same answer as adding the ZIR and the ZSR, but the one thing I want to caution you is that the ZIR is not equal to the homogeneous response, and the ZSR is not equal to the particular response. Okay? They may have, the ZIR may have terms that look similar to the homogeneous response, but they're not exactly equal. Similarly, the particular solution has one component that looks like the component in the ZSR, but we cannot, they're not uh, strictly equal to one another. So that's just a, um, a reminder or uh, so that you understand a little bit about how you can relate solution of differential equations using Laplace to solution of differential equations using the classic homogeneous plus particular solution approach. Okay, so that finishes up our short video on solving differential equations using Laplace. This video was made for the ECE 220 course at George Mason University, and if you want more information about that course or the university, please check out these websites. Thank you for watching.